deep obscure <laughs> galaxy, an obscure solar system, an obscure planet to the galaxy. Uh, but to neuroscientists, the most interesting thing about this is that everything you know about your world, your galaxy, your planet, and every action that you take to act on your world is um, mediated by this three pounds of uh, gray and black matter sitting inside your head, the brain right here. Uh, and this is the most interesting object in this world to us. Um, it's, there's a lot at stake in the study of neuroscience. I think that neuroscience is going to be the grand scientific challenge of the 21st century, the way that was, physics was in the first half of the 20th, and genetics uh, was in the second half of the 20th. Uh, it, there's obviously a lot at stake here for being able to treat neurologic and psychiatric disease uh, across the lifespan, which takes so much toll on our well-being. But I think it goes deeper than that. Neuroscience uh, has potential to give us insight in what kind of animals we are really. Where does thought come from? Where does emotion come from? Creativity. Even things like our moral judgments and moral sensibilities. And then finally, I think neuroscience will say a lot in the long run about who we will become. So how we'll interact with our technologies. Many of you have heard brain-machine interfaces. These are a really important growing field, this gathering uh, <laughs> momentum as, as we speak, really. So the study of the brain and really understanding the brain is uh, a big challenge and a big opportunity for us. For neuroscientists like myself, our, our big challenge is to reverse engineer the brain. So reverse engineering which simply means that instead of starting with parts and putting them together to make a whole, you start with a whole and you study it and its parts and try to figure out how the thing works. So reverse engineering is something you would do to it in any spy satellite or something like that. Only this is the organ that sits inside our heads. It's almost infathomably complex. There are about 100 billion neurons in each of our brains. Uh, each of those makes about 1,000 synapses or electrochemical connections to other cells in the brain. So that gives you about 100 trillion synapses, which just is astounding in its complexity. This is what a human brain looks like in surgery. So neurosurgeons frequently expose the brain like this for therapeutic purposes uh, and also do experiments with informed consent of subjects while they're in there. Uh, and the basic question to me, when you look at something like this, and you say, my mission, your mission, Dr. Newsom, if you choose to accept it, is to reverse engineer this beast. My, my first question is, where are the knobs on this thing? Okay, what do I turn? How do I manipulate it? Where do I, I mean, how do I even start in something that has 100 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses, right? Um, and if I were presented with something like this, I'd have an idea of where to start, right? There's a knob here I could turn. There's some toggle switches that I can flip. Uh, some more down here, I can sort of examine the behavior of this thing and start to analyze it. Uh, ultimately, however, you want to pop the top off the thing and see what's inside it. And when you look inside a device like this, what you see is circuits, okay? And the amazing thing is, as we've known for a little over a century now, what, what you see when you actually look inside the human brain or animal brains are circuits. Okay, they're, they're little computing devices that have inputs and outputs, and they're organized in very regular kinds of circuits. Uh, and I would say that the study of these circuits and understanding how circuits do things inside of brains, how circuits interact with each other, how circuits of circuits uh, form pathways in the brain, this is the central challenge to really deciphering the functional mysteries of the brain. In the course of my professional lifetime, there have been four critical barriers to that. And there's going to be a quiz on these as we go through the rest of the talk. But the first, bar the first barrier is just our ability to map the circuits. Uh, standard neuroanatomy is very laborious, very slow. And actually, to get a map the way you have an atlas, a road map of the Bay Area road system, is extremely difficult. Second challenge is to measure the dynamics, the signal dynamics that are actually flowing in those circuits once you get some idea of what the circuit is like in some particular area of the brain. So if you want to get from here to Berkeley at the end of this talk, you want that map, that static map of roadways because they could strain your possible choices. But you also want to know what traffic is flowing on different roadways. You want to know something about the signals and the dynamics there. Uh, the third big challenge in my career has been, okay, if we can measure the signals and get some idea of what's going there, how do we know 
how they're causally related to things going elsewhere in the brain or to behavior. And you really want to be able to manipulate those signals that are flowing. It's not enough just to watch them and admire them. You really want to manipulate them. So a highway engineer wants to be able to close a section of highway and understand and know how it affects traffic everywhere else in the system. Or if you spend a billion dollars on a new bridge, how's that going to affect traffic in the whole system? And then finally, you said, get a theory for crying out loud. Because neuroscience is largely a pre-theoretical stage. That's changing right now, but it's largely pre-theoretical. And it's not even clear that there will be any whole theory of how the brain works. There may be lots of little theories that are local to different circuits with different architecture in the brain. Uh, the great news here is that we live in an extremely exciting time in neuroscience because the barriers are falling on all these fronts. Okay? So due to technological innovation primarily, uh, much of which has gone on here at Stanford, which I'll show you in a few minutes, uh, we're actually improving in all of these areas, especially these first three. We're a little behind in the theory area, but we're doing something about that. And for the next few minutes, what I'm going to do is take you on a cook's tour of the brain out to the frontiers. I'm going to show you the latest developments in mapping circuits, measuring dynamics, and manipulating the signals and testing effects on behavior. And I'll have just a couple of words left uh, about theory. So first of all, what do we want? What's the first thing? I promised you there'd be a quiz. Maps, right? We want maps of the circuits. So here's a really interesting paper that was published a few years back in Nature by the Dyseroff Lab here at Stanford. This is a mouse brain sitting over a piece of text. This is exactly the same mouse brain sitting over exactly the, piece of, the same piece of text. But it's been electrochemically treated to remove all the lipids from the brain, which are the light scattering elements. And so this brain is now transparent. You can stain a brain in the state for transmitters, pick your favorite one, serotonin, dopamine, catecholamines, whatever you want to do, different molecules of interest. You can use ideological uh, attachments, the attachment fluorescent molecules like GFP, which Jessica mentioned. And you can actually trace the circuits uh, in, in rapidly accelerated fashion compared to the old-fashioned <coughs> way that I did during graduate school, which is to slice it into pieces like a loaf of bread and stain each sliced um, independently of each other. So what you get from something like this, you take the whole transparent brain, you put it on a microscope, and you slice it in effect optically just by focusing down a tiny bit at a time and then putting these maps together. This is a video that appeared at the, in a Nature paper in which uh, Dysteroff published these things, Dysteroff in his lab. Uh, and these are not animations or artist conception. This is, this is real data that's been put together with this technique. And you can see uh, massive amounts of cells here in the hippocampus that are sending their axons down to uh, other structures far more subcortical. This is the cortex up here. You can see these cell bodies and the axons ascending to the surface of the cortex. And this is, uh, you know, this is jaw-dropping to someone raised on the kind of neuroanatomy and histology that I did. This speeds up the process of getting circuit diagrams by minimum of an order of magnitude and probably more like two orders of magnitude. So this is a whole mouse brain and you're just basically zooming in and out of the thing at various resolutions and able to get this kind of cellular resolution. So this is a really remarkable development, a technical development, but that leads to the ability to do better and faster science. And then what is the second thing that we want? Even if we have the special maps, what we want? Signal, signal, signal. signal dynamics, exactly. We want to know about dynamics. Now what you're looking at here is a real technical innovation in our ability to obtain dynamics and dynamical activity on the brain. This blue outline is the head of a larval zebrafish. The tail is way out here on the wall. Uh, this larval zebrafish has a magnificent property, which Jessica anticipated, in that it's transparent. So because the skin is transparent, you can focus in on the brain like this. This zebrafish has been genetically manipulated so that the cells uh, contain a protein that fluoresces when the calcium concentration increases inside the cell. Calcium increase is a proxy for electrical activity. Calcium flows into the cell when the cells are electrically active. And so all of these little orange cells that you see are electrically active at the moment this particular frame of the video was taken. But I'm going to show you a video now. And you have to understand that a person like me, uh, when I was in graduate school, I recorded from cells their electrical activity one at a time. And over a course of a year, I might have a, a 
precious little bundle of two or three hundred recordings that I'm trying to put them together and see what the population activity is like post hoc after recording them one at a time. But here, this nervous system consists of about 80,000 neurons, and these folks here at Janelia Farm Research Campus, uh, published in about the same year as the Clarity paper, are able to see these cells linking on and off in real time. So this is a living animal. It's immobilized in agar. Okay, so it's breathing. It's alive. Uh, you can see little systems of cells that are firing, alternating with each other. You can see signals flowing down here to the spinal cord. A lot of visual activity up here, and boom, there's that big flash right there. And you know, as a neuroscientist, I asked myself, what the hell was that? Um, was that, was that, uh, you know, was that um, uh, zebrafish thought? Uh, was it a little epileptic seizure? Was it, um, you know, somebody slammed the door in the room and startled the animal? And fundamentally, we don't know the answer to that. Um, and that, but that points to a weakness of this preparation, right? Because you want to know how this activity is linked to behavior. But when the animal's immobilized, he can't pay. He can't do the normal things that a zebrafish would do. You know, flick his tail and escape or see things and respond to them or eat a little crustacean sitting out in front of them. So here's this activity, and you can see how this mesmerizes someone like me who previously studied these neurons one at a time. And these silly people over there Newfangled technology can record 80,000 of them at a time in one experiment. It's just mind boggling. So, um, you know, to cure the behavior problem, Mark Schnitzer here in applied physics and biology to Stanford and then a little microscope that weighs about four grams that can be actually implanted on a mouse head uh, and a little hole cut in the skull while the mouse is scurrying around an environment, fishing out food pellets from this environment here. And through this microscope, microendoscope, you can actually record single cells of a structure called the hippocampus, which has the uh, uh, spatial map for the mouse. So this is a, an amazing new development that you can actually record these kinds of activity that you saw in the zebrafish, but you could do it in an animal that's awake and behaving and performing some kind of purposeful behavior. So our ability to get the dynamics is really, I mean, it's, it's, it's light years ahead of where we were a decade or a decade and a half ago. So what's the third thing that we want? We've got a map, we've got dynamics, and we want Manipulation. We want to manipulate these signals. So this is where an amazing new technique uh, published, you know, about 14 years ago now, again by the Dyson Roth lab at Stanford, the same lab in the Department of Bioengineering here. And I don't have time to go into optogenetics, but basically optogenetics is a set of genetic tricks for inserting foreign genes into the system of neurons that you're particularly into. These genes express the protein, which are ion channels that sit in the membrane, and by the way, are responsive to light. So you shine blue light onto them, and they open, and current flows, and these cells become active. So now you've got a knob, and you can, you can turn on certain sets of cells, or you can turn them off just by turning blue light on and off, or turning yellow light on and off, you can hit the cell. So this is amazing, right? Because because uh, you know our, our neuroscience's tools for doing causal manipulations have been very crude in the past, but now suddenly they've become very powerful. Um, and I'm going to show you the next video. I'm going to show you optogenetics in action. So what you're going to see is is a um, is a mouse in its home cage. Uh, it'll, it has the uh, fiber optic on it that gets the light into the brain. Uh, you'll see that the mouse just kind of runs around its home cage and acts very normally, and they become accustomed to this fiber optic. At the end of the experiment, you just unhook the fiber optic, and the animal has a little uh, head implant right here at the base, but is not disturbed by it at all. So what's going to happen here, you're going to have a male mouse in this environment. You've got a female, the intruder, who's introduced into the environment. And the typical behavior of a male is simply to be curious about the female, the new female in the neighborhood. That's the big surprise to you, right? <laughs> As opposed to if a male were introduced, there would be conflict. And this mouse has the fiber optic implanted in a structure called the amygdala that's important in emotion regulation, uh, mood regulation. And the, there's a group of cells in the amygdala that we believe are involved in aggressive behavior, uh, also in sexual behavior, by the way, but in, in aggressive behavior. And they have been infected with these, with these foreign genes. And so when they turn on the blue light on the laser, it's just this little cluster of two to 5,000 cells down the amygdala that's being affected. And you'll see the effect of it. 
So this is from the Anderson lab at Caltech. This is halorhodopsin stimulation of these uh, neurons. Here's the male. He, you can see he's very curious about this female he's never seen before. He's giving her the love attention, but then this laser turns on. And as soon as the laser turns on, he goes into attack mode. Now this is the way he would treat a new male in his cage, okay? And she was receiving his affection and doesn't know what to do. Now the laser gets turned off and he's just a normal curious mouse again, you know, interacting normally with this female. So this is the power of optogenetics, okay? And um, not everything is as simple. You turn on and off things like aggression, but if you want to ask me about more complex things, feel free to as we go along. I mean, at the end, the question and answer period. So here's, here's, you can see these barriers that I outlined you know, during my career toward understanding these circuits. Uh, the ability to map the circuits has been very difficult, but with clarity, and by the way, clarity is just one of at least half a dozen new techniques we have for mapping the circuits. Uh, signal dynamics are, are just amazingly accessible now compared to what they were due to new forms of microscopy and this calcium imaging. Being able to manipulate the signals, optogenetics was kind of one of the first players on the scene, but there are others. There's chemogenetics and all kinds of new tricks for actually manipulating these signals with genetic specificity. And as I alluded to, we're a little behind on the theory, but ultimately the brain is nothing if not a nonlinear dynamical system. And the kinds of theory that electrical engineers and physicists apply to understand nonlinear dynamical systems in other places in the world are now being applied to the brain, and I think have the promise of giving us some new fundamental insights and extract understanding from all these new data that we're able to get. So what good is this? I mean, somebody asked Jessica that after her talk, and that's a great question after my talk. And um, here's one thing that, uh, good that comes from this kind of circuit knowledge. So some of you, how many of you have heard of deep brain stimulation? Is it true? Okay, so almost everyone here, a ton of people have heard. So you can think of this as a pacemaker for the brain. This is a treatment for um, advanced Parkinson's disease. There's an electrical pacemaker under the clavicle, just like you would have for a cardiac uh, pacemaker. And uh, if the electrical connection is connected to this electrode, which is way down deep in the brain in a little tiny structure called the subthalamic nucleus. And the subthalamic nucleus is known as a target uh, for treatment of motor symptoms uh, because of this very beautiful uh, circuit kind of uh, dissection, circuit identification that was done over a period of decades in non-human model organisms, like Jessica suggested. Um, in, in this case, it was done in monkeys. Uh, it was done with old-fashioned technology, and it took much longer, but it could be done much faster now. But I just want to show you the power of this. Uh, to date, there, this number has actually doubled. There are about 200,000 people around the world who have uh, received these implants. They're done every week here at Stanford Hospital and most other major hospitals around uh, the world. And this is one of the early videos, actually made in the early 2000s and filmed and, and presented as a feature on Dateline and NBC News. This is Sybil. She's a woman with advanced Parkinson's disease. You can find all these videos out on the web. She's totally agreed to this kind of thing. And um, so I'm not, there's no confidential information being violated here. Um, I'm going to try and see if I can go over to HDMI right now because that will give you the sound. And it's, even if the image flickers a bit, it's um, very impressive to hear her talking along and through this. Let's see if the oh yeah, we got to do that one. There we go. Thank you, Jessica. Okay. Let's give this a whirl and see if it's going to work. And it's going to flicker a bit, but you can listen to Sybil, I hope. Oops. Uh, Even a simple task like eating breakfast was a frustrating battle with her own body. How can you live your life when you're shaking so much? It's extremely difficult. Sometimes even overwhelmed, you know. And I get very emotional. Sometimes I cry. It's, it's just a hard thing to do. The disease had gotten so bad that sometimes her muscles froze completely, making her face almost expressionless, and her legs almost useless. The woman who once was always on the go could barely move, confined to a wheelchair. 
Okay, so this is a fairly advanced state of Parkinson's disease. She heard about the new deep brain stimulation therapy that was being tried at Emory uh, Medical Center. She lives in North Georgia, or lived in North Georgia. Uh, so here she is, literally, at the first day after having one electrode planted in the subthalamic nucleus on one side of her brain. This is uh, after the operation, the electrode. moment that would test Sybil's dream. After too long, he was trapped in a wheelchair, which he'd finally be able to walk. Hello. My right arm swings down. I'm my right arm for I don't know how long. So she comments that she hasn't swung her right arm, and I don't know how long. And it's her right arm because the, there's a the, there's a stimulating electrode on the left so subthalamic nucleus, but not on the right. But this result was so good, she went back in and had a second electrode implanted. And this next video is only two or three months after that second surgery. Month after her second surgery, when we caught up with Sybil again. So Sybil, how do you feel? Great. <laughs> Remember that wheelchair? It was gathering dust in the garage. It doesn't have to. What can you do now? Oh, good heavens! What is that? <laughs> Sybil and Alvin had hoped for a lot from the surgery, but the outcome was better than they could have imagined. So this is remarkable stuff, right? This is almost downright biblical, right? The blind shall see, the lame shall walk. And, um, and this is the promise of, of what it can mean ultimately for us to understand the circuits of the brain and how they interact and produce behavior. Now, a couple of caveats I have to make about this. This is not a cure for Parkinson's disease. I think Parkinson's disease comes on because a certain class of cells deep in the brain still called dopaminergic cells start dying. We do not know why they start dying, a ton of research money and effort being poured into that. But what this is, is a circuit level treatment, at least for the symptoms. The first level of defense against Parkinson's is L-dopa therapy, which many of you are familiar with. But ultimately, the cells keep dying. You have to increase your doses of L-dopa, and ultimately, the side effects become worse than the, than the disease. Um, so. Uh, this then is some, something that can give people a year to three years of their lives back. And it doesn't work the same to the same efficacy in all people, but I've actually you know, met a, a few people who, who um, I've had them come and appear in my classes, in fact, one guy in particular, uh, for whom this was worked just as effectively as it did on civil. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to uh, quit stroboscoping you here, and we're going to turn on the lights, and um, I'll just um, wrap up by saying that I think that we're really in the middle of a uh, revolution in neuroscience now, and I will, um, I'm, it's, it's so exciting, I tell students that it's so exciting for, for them, I wish that I would have the career, uh, I was looking at the career that they had, it was so slow uh, during my career, but it's going to be so rapid over the next couple of decades. So with that, I will stop at uh, your little cook's tour of the future of neuroscience, and I will answer questions that you might have.